stories with me, Yoga Killian. A big thank you to Marco Reyes for filling in for me last week while I was investigating an unusual story about a terror crocodile in Borneo that grew a taste for human flesh. But that's a story for another time. Today's account is from one of my older entries in the Killian Notebook, where I was in the Perak state in the west coast of Peninsula Malaysia. This is Entry 28, The Cursed Car. On a humid afternoon, I found myself in a bustling Indian cafe, seeking shelter from the imminent downpour. The air inside was thick with the aroma of spiced tea as the first drops began to fall. Sharing my table was Mr. Azman, not his real name of course, a senior lawyer in the area having practiced in the state's capital all his life. Azman was intrigued by my quest for paranormal and horror accounts. Naturally, I had asked him over tea if he had any stories that straddled the eerie chasm between the explainable and the unknown, and the story that he shared was a curious one. His voice dropped to a near whisper, drawing me closer into the intimacy of his narrative. Clearly, his reputation was at stake. His eyes reflecting the stormy gloom outside, he began telling me about his early years as a running down lawyer, sometime in the early 80s. He was representing a client in a rather peculiar case involving a car accident. Osman described how his client had bought a car second-hand from a reputable dealer. Initially, it seemed a fortunate acquisition, but soon after, the vehicle began to exhibit troubling behaviour. It would accelerate on its own, brake abruptly, or veer off to the side without any apparent cause. His client was baffled, especially as there were several mechanics he consulted. Each one of them had checked the car from bumper to bumper, yet found nothing mechanically amiss. The mystery deepened when the client returned to the original seller, who was equally perplexed. The car had no prior history of such faults. As the problem escalated, Nazman's client came to one too many near accidents a nagging suspicion began to arise. Osman's client was the superstitious sort. Using connections in local government departments, he traced the history of the car's ownership and delved deeper into the vehicle's past. What he discovered was unsettling. Many years prior, a tragedy had struck when a woman overwhelmed by despair had jumped from her apartment building, landing on this very car. Worse still, this was her husband's own car. Of course, the then owner found a way to cover up the fact and quickly resold the vehicle before moving away. The revelation was chilling. But in the pragmatic world of law, such stories held no ground in court. Preparing for the legal proceedings, Osman met with his client several months later to discuss the case. However, the man that sat before him bore little resemblance to the one he met initially. Gaunt and pallid, with dark circles under his eyes, he seemed consumed by an inner torment. After some prodding, the client finally gave in. He explained that one night he was driving alone along a secluded road flanked by oil palm estates. These are dark roads with no lights at all for stretches. In one of these stretches, a figure suddenly materialized in his headlights. A woman, standing motionless in the middle of the road. She was contorted but remained motionless. Frozen by fear, yet driven by a desperate hope to rid himself of the car's curse, 
Asman's client made a split-second decision. There was no way to drive off the road, so he closed his eyes, floored the accelerator, and drove straight through her. As he did, he felt a thud on the front of the car. At that moment of impact, the figure dissolved into nothing but a cloud of black ash which filled the car swirling around him. He screamed in fear for minutes but would not take his foot off the gas. Overwhelmed by fear, the client drove the cursed vehicle until the first rays of sun emerged and then detoured to a nearby abandoned mining pool, one of the hundreds in the area. When he arrived, he got out and let the car roll into the waters. He watched as it sank beneath the surface, hoping to bury its malevolent past forever. He then walked about 20 kilometers to the nearest town, a journey during which he vowed never to speak of the incident again. As the rain lashed against the windows in that cafe where I sat with Asman, the story seemed to merge with the storm, both elements enhancing the other's chilling effect. The tale did not end with the watery grave of the car. Curious about the aftermath, I probed further into the client's life post-incident. Osman shared that the man had become reclusive, a shadow of his former self, perhaps still tormented by the ghost he believed he encountered. Before we parted, Osman mentioned a peculiar postscript to the story. A few weeks after the car was submerged, Locals from around the area reported seeing an apparition near the mining pool. A woman, they claimed, who walked over the water at dusk, disappearing before the night fully fell. They blamed Asman's client for it, and as Asman put it then, there is no denying that it could be related to his end, but that case is closed. Asman wouldn't say anything more, claiming that he did not want to revisit a closed case. But he did pass me the contact details of someone who might be willing to speak to me, if I wanted to head down this path. As I left the cafe, the rain easing, but the air still heavy with unspoken thoughts, I couldn't help but feel drawn to the layered complexities of Asman's narrative. It was a story that intertwined the spectral with the tangible. The figure might not be real, but there was documentary proof of the accident and the black ash. This tale, like the relentless monsoon, had washed over me, leaving a residue of eerie contemplation about the fine line between reality and the supernatural. As I walked through the sodden streets of the area, the tale lingered in my mind, mingling with the rhythms of the bustling night market. The locals seemed to move in a world that effortlessly accepted the coexistence of the everyday and the ethereal. Armed with the contact details Asman had given me, I decided to delve deeper into the community's tales. Over the next few days, I spoke with more locals each story adding layers to the rich tapestry of cultural heritage that embrace both the seen and unseen. These narratives often featured elements of nature, a deep reverence for the forests, the mountains, and especially the waters that were believed to be the abodes of spirits, both benign and malevolent. Eventually, I called the number Asman had given me. It was an elderly woman recounting a tale of her encounter near the same mining pool where the haunted car had been submerged. She spoke of hearing whispers carried across the water late at night. 
whispers that spoke of unresolved tragedies in restless spirits. But what emerged from the rest of the conversation was far more chilling than whispers. It turns out that Asman's client's vow of secrecy was not quite kept. As more sightings of the lady in the water emerged, the locals of the area found out about the car incident and pieced together the source of the problem. Over months, Asman's client received threats and lodged police reports for his safety. Then, one early morning, a body was found floating in the mining pool. It was Asman's client. The official story was that he went for a swim and drowned. But the lady claimed that there could have been far more to it. Was he drawn back to the pool by some malevolent force? Was a sacrifice needed to appease the lady of the pool? Or was this just plain revenge? Regardless, if you go by the locals' account, nothing has changed. The car still sits deep at the bottom of the mining pool, and the water spirit, or in the local dialect, Hantu Ayer, still calls out to those unfortunate enough to pass by on a humid night.